Are you thinking about biking this winter? Or do you want to try to do it more regularly? In this episode, we are covering our four categories for successful winter biking. These include visibility and safety, equipment, attitude, and strategy. Hello and welcome to the Bike Here podcast, a podcast inspiring you to get on the bike and leave the car at home. I'm your host, Arlie Greenwald, with Bike Shop Girl, a family cyclery in Colorado. Bike Here is my way to bring a friendly and inclusive family bike shop to your ears while also talking to amazing people that are empowering others to leave the car at home. Just a quick thank you to today's podcast sponsor, which is Kryptonite. For over 45 years, Kryptonite has been your high-quality bike lock provider. Now, Kryptonite wants to help you light your way with their street light series. These are lights I personally sell and have tested, easy-to-use mounts, fully USB rechargeable, and I love how some of these lights have side ports to give additional visibility from the side. To learn more about Kryptonite locks or lights, visit kryptonitelock.com. I do want to dig a little bit more into saying thank you to Kryptonite for sponsoring this. Producing, editing, hosting, and marketing a podcast isn't free, and I really appreciate the support of some brands that have jumped right in when I told them about my idea of a podcast geared towards helping people that are interested but concerned in replacing car trips with bike trips. So please visit our sponsors when possible, give them a digital high five on social media, and share this episode far and wide. All right, let's get this episode started with Luke from Perennial Cycle in Minneapolis. Luke, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm telling you, when it comes to winter biking, yes, I've got years of experience at this, so I'm ready. I figured Luke was a great resource because Luke owns, operates, wrangles a top commuter bike shop in Minneapolis, and he himself rides every day. I see his updates of, you know, if his electric assist cargo bike is working and shifting and below, well below zero temperatures a couple times. Um, So Luke, Minneapolis, you guys are diehard commuters, even through really hard winters. So can you just give us an intro about yourself, maybe some background about your commuting and then the bike shop? Yeah, you bet. Uh, Thanks, Arlie. Happy to be here. Um, So I've been in business for 26 years now, and um, I've been commuting um, daily for a lot longer than that. Um, And um, yeah, Minneapolis is definitely uh, cold and we get snow um, and it sticks. It's not snow that just comes down and then melts the next day. Um, and you know, this year we have already had multiple stretches of sub-zero weather, um, though it fluctuates today, it was 20 degrees when I left. And so that felt fabulous. Um, anyway, so I've been commuting for a long time by winter and I have evolved. I've gotten a little bit better at it. Um, and, um, we, we help a lot of people in the shop that do, um, also commute daily and and not that everybody's doing it every single day we have plenty of people um that have set aside two or three days a week um and they're watching the weather they don't like to be out when there's fresh snow on the ground and that's amazing as as well so um we do we deal with a, a pretty good range of people um as far as who's getting out how they're getting out our we we have families that are dropping kids off at school through the winter, which to me is absolutely amazing and awesome. So and you guys, where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And I want to just mention before we get into the bulk of this, you guys have so many winter bike commuters that you have a winter maintenance membership. Yeah. The winter maintenance membership is completely amazing. Like I think back, you know, when, you know, there was really just a few bike 
nerds, mostly working in shops that were on the roads. And the infrastructure has improved in Minneapolis. And um, there's just been more and more kind of waking up. Um, and a lot of people are doing it because they want to try and just do better with their carbon footprint. Um, these days, yeah, we have... I think we have like 45 people signed up for our winter maintenance membership. It means that they can bring their bike by once a week. And um, that day we will thaw it out and then we'll clean it all up and lube everything up. Um, And we we're able to get that done. It's not an immediate thing, but we try and get it done in an hour and a half or two hours. So if people want to hang out at the coffee shop next door um, we can do that. Some of them live really close, and so they just drop it off and pick it up the next morning. Um, when we started the winter maintenance membership program, I certainly envisioned um, a whole bunch of, I don't know, white guys like me walking in and getting their memberships. The reality is, is it's a huge range of people um, that have seen it, recognize it, and they ride their bikes enough in the winter that they they see how bad winter can be on a bike. And yet if we clean it up once a week and keep it lubed come spring, it really doesn't look different than it did in the fall. It's just basic wear and tear. So yeah, we, I'm, I'm a huge supporter of the winter maintenance membership plan. So I like it a lot. Wow. I might, uh, pick that up. (laughs) Yeah, I would recommend it. I would recommend it for sure. That's awesome. And so for today, we're really going to just break winter biking and specifically winter bike commuting because here in Denver, we have a lot of people that fat bike, which is more to me as a sport, unless you're using that fat bike as your commuting device. So today we're going to be talking about winter bike commuting and the four categories that I look at it when I'm helping a customer or a friend. First off is visibility and safety, right? Like our ultimate goal if you're driving, biking, walking, is getting home at the end of the day. And then we'll move into equipment. So that's equipment for your bike, but also for your body. And then attitude and strategy. And these last two things, I think, are often um, forgotten about. You know, we, as an industry, uh, the bike industry really gets geeked out about gear. So I think the visibility and safety and the attitude and strategy are things that, you know, we're going to have show notes for this. So if we talk a lot and you need to take notes or you need to look back, just know everything that we're talking about. I'll have links on our website, bikehere.com under episode number two. So Luke, I'm going to get you fired up. I know. So let's talk about visibility and safety. Totally. I, I got to say, I love the attitude and strategy. That's that's a really, really good thing to talk about right away. Um, but anyway, let's start with visibility. I definitely am a huge believer in, in being seen. Winter is super dark. Like it, you know, literally here, if it's and an overcast scene. So yes, a little bit, a little bit. Um, but here, literally, if it's an overcast day at like 4.15 in the afternoon, it is starting to look dark outside and yeah that's a little bit depressing and so you just really have to just be prepared for that it's not it's not any kind of it doesn't change anything as far as whether you're going to do it or whether you're going to get home from work but it is like something you have to be thinking about um and you have to kind of get yourself psyched up for it as far as your attitude goes but you also just you need lights and um I met, I've mentioned this to you before, Arlie, that I wrote a blog pa- post like six, seven years ago, and I, I mentioned in it that I, I get asked all the time, like, what's what's like, what's the most important part that you're using on your bike? What's the when you're riding in the winter? Um, you know, and we're I'm used to getting the thing like, oh, you're just completely crazy to do that. But then people get curious and they want to know what it is, and um, you know, when I was younger, I will say I kind of would geek out on the gear um, and like the certain tires or certain type of shifting or whether I was doing single speed or not. And then at a certain point, it just struck me that the most important thing by a long shot was being seen on the road. So visibility is huge for me. 
I am using a, two sets of lights on the bike. I'm, I'm a big fan of dynamo lighting. So that lighting that the front wheel is powering your lights. So that's, that's kind of permanently attached on my bike. And I always know that that works. And then I also use a helmet light that has both a forward and a rear light on it. Um, I'm putting a, you know, a big, uh, lime green, uh, windbreaker on over my jacket so that, um, I can just be, I can be comfortable that I'm being seen on the road. Um, I know that, you know, if I were to get run over by a bus, I know that my wife is not going to wonder whether my feet were cold or not. (laughs) (laughs) It's not going to be like, Oh, game over. Um, and so while I do need gear that's going to keep my feet warm. It's it's quite a bit lower in the priority than just plain visibility. Um, and so for me, it's it's two sets of lights. Um, one of them's up on my helmet, so it's up high, and it's it's strobing the whole time. Um, and then the other the lights that are kind of shining my path. Those are dynamo lights that are coming that are powered by my front hub. That's awesome. And I want to add to that because I kind of have the same setup, but I ride an electric bike. So my lights are powered off my bike. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, the only, I want to add in this that I'm obsessed with monkey lights. Ah, fun. Uh, You know, the wheel lights. Yeah, Um, totally. Yeah. You know, because it adds a lot of light from the side. Yeah. Where, you know, and if it's wet or, or snowy or, you know, the ground is wet at all, it, like, makes this, like, halo around you, which is really yeah. fun. And people are like, oh, what is that? Instead of, like, F the cyclist. Um, <laughs> you know, and there's more and more lights that are now um, integrated in, in helmets and things like that. But I don't know if we run the same one, but I use the light and motion what is it called? Like the Viz 360 or something on my helmet? Yeah, I do. I use the same one. Yeah. And it's completely waterproof. Um, I have been trying one from surface, um, that the battery can come out, which is nice. So you're not just dedicated to that one. But the reason I use them to your point, it's higher. But the other thing is on bike paths, I like to be able to sight my turns. So like if you're you're a mountain biker, you'll understand, but this allows you to look around a corner instead of waiting for your bike to turn. Uh, so I can look down, you know, bridges, I can look down dark streets, all those things. Um, so I'm complete, fully appreciate your setup. And I think the only other thing I would say is um, maybe in the future, we can talk about dynamo lights on a whole different attitude and uh, yeah. episode because I find that people think they're just really expensive and there's drag and yada, yada, yada. But other than electric bikes, um, I think almost every cyclist should have dynamo lights if you live where it's cold because the new batteries do die when it's cold very quickly. The range, yeah, the range just gets cut way down as far as the length of time that your battery will work. Um, so yeah, I'm with you on that. That's big. Another thing with that helmet light is if there is a parked car um, that that is thinking about entering the street that you're riding down, yeah, you're able to shine right at the rider <laughs> or right at the driver. And so um, that is helpful. I, I like being able to swing my head around and see what's going on. Um, so those monkey lights that you're using, Arlie, yeah. do they like spell out? something or what i think they can so my most popular one um they make one that's called an m204 and my bike shop i sell a lot of cargo bikes and kids bikes so smaller wheel sizes a lot of times like 20 inch wheels and so the m204 has the least amount of leds but because of that i can go on a smaller wheel so i can easily fit it on a kid's 16 inch wheel and it doesn't throw as many cool patterns. Like the more LEDs, the longer yeah. the LED pattern can be. And they make really cool ones. Like I've actually been talking um, to the guy over there to see if I could get a custom one for bike here. Um, Cause he does a one that looks like the world <laughs> and wow, the, fun. Yeah. you know, the earth and the bike here logo is pretty close to that. Um, so I, 
it's one of those like people ask me like, hey, what should I get for stocking stuffers? And I'm like, number one, service. Get them a, a service gift card. Every yeah. every person that rides a bike is going to need service. And then two, do they have a wheel light? It's twenty five dollars. Here you go. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, uh, adding more lights is is never a bad thing, right? So having having a some small rechargeable available um, just in your bag, you will at a certain point need it. So yeah, yeah really I keep. Um, you know, we can have a whole conversation actually about, um, battery and battery management systems. And yeah, <laughs> I got really right. geeked out because I've, I get really annoyed when somebody buys a $65 led headlight and the battery doesn't last because it doesn't have like a management system. So like once yes. you've killed it and let it sit for a while, it no longer will fully get charged. Right. Um, and I realize we're getting into the weeds of equipment, yeah. but I keep a um, double A battery set from Planet Bike in my work backpack. It's like twenty dollars total. Yeah, and I do this because my backpack is never left out in the cold. And two, I've run into so many instances where a friend or me or a loved one, their light is dead. Yeah, right. You know, and, no, it's a pretty common occurrence, right? Right. And so like here, here's here's a twenty dollar light set. Come pay me if you would like. If not, you know, I didn't pay twenty dollars for it, so here you go. Um <laughs> But like could you imagine as like a bike shop owner if you saw somebody without a light and they get hit? <laughs> so, oh, I know. No, it it freaks me out. No, I'm I'm with you all the way. Um there are more cyclists out and about that um, are kind of like they're, they seem to be going stealth. <laughs> and I don't think going stealth mode is a good idea if you're riding on the streets. That's for sure. Yes. So we actually just organically transitioned into equipment. So to me, it breaks yeah, down into like right bike equipment and on your, your like your personal equipment. And yeah, I think and I don't know if we can get into this, Luke, but. For me, your equipment changes, and I don't know if this is the exact number, but like if your commute's over 25 minutes, you kind of like naturally need to change into more like outdoor cycling type clothing. Yes. Um, under 25 minutes, I wear, you know, basically LL Bean jeans with flannel inside, the flannel yeah. lined, and boots and my winter jacket. And I'm good, but over 25, and that's down to like zero, right? Fahrenheit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, if you could talk about like what your strategy is, I don't know if you carry clothing in your store. I personally only carry like buffs and really small tchotchkes because I'm in the attitude I'm selling bikes for short distances, and in Denver, in Colorado, most people are outdoorsmen. Or women, and so they already have a lot of the clothing they need. Yeah. So that that last comment to yours, if you are in Minnesota, you already have long johns, or you have flannel lined pants, um, or you have wind layers that you can put on. Um, and so, no, I keep it pretty simple, and um, I'm not one to be pushing a whole lot of extra gear um, on people, especially if it's someone that's coming in saying, I'm thinking I'd like to do this. I haven't done it before. Um, there are some kind of big ticket items that you're going to have to spend money on. Studded tires are absolutely essential if you want to ride in Minnesota, it's just, there's just no way you can do it w without them. Um, or, and I'm not saying uh, certainly when I was younger, which I'm not, <laughs> um, I went plenty of years without studded tires, but I fell two or three times every winter. It was just kind of part of the deal. I didn't really think much of it. Um, well, no, I mean, now, I'm a, I'm a dedicated commuter, um, and so, yeah, I'm going to talk, anybody that's coming in thinking about winter biking, I'm going to talk about studded tires immediately. 
Um, fenders would be another huge one. Um, I, I think fenders, any any commuting bike fenders are are pretty big in the winter. It's yeah, it's it's almost essential. Um, and so there are some things you're going to have to buy for your bikes light, and then we'd get back to lights. Um, and and yet it's not overwhelming. So for I don't know, two two hundred dollars, you can get yourself started. You can get yourself the basics. Um, and then yeah, I'm going to trust that if you lived in Minnesota last winter, <laughs> you're going to already have yourself um, some heavy mittens or gloves. Um, and, um, you're definitely going to have boots. You're going to have, uh, a jacket. Um, and typically when it comes to the upper layers, we're going to be thinking more in terms of fall weights. Um, you're not going to wear the same jacket that you wear when you're just walking around, um, because that in Minnesota is a super heavy duty jacket and you're going to be sweating in no time. So, um, there definitely are things that you kind of have to be thinking about to get, um, I don't know, to be successful at setting yourself up for daily commuting in the winter. Um, but yeah, clothing isn't one of them. It's, it's one that if things go well, then it's like, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna look at some some really really nice gloves or the the pogies that go on the ends of your handlebars so that your your hand fits inside a, of a little area. That's super nice to have. Um, but the fact is, you know, a pair of choppers, pretty old school. But what is that? Oh, no, <laughs> choppers are these um, leather outer and it, they're mittens and it's a leather outer and then a wool mitten inner and the two are fit inside of each oh, other and and I you can these. do you can do multiple like you can do you know three sets of inners with your outer shell anyway they're just they're big mittens is what they are um and they're very warm um and so i don't know that's something uh you lose a lot of dexterity <laughs> Uh, <laughs> obviously, um, yeah, this is actually like, I think we'll have a, a 2.0 version or maybe a 201. Like, yeah, like this is the basics, but I think for example, my winter bike, I switched out the shifting so that I can just use my thumb Yeah, instead of, um, like older style Shimano shifting, you had to use your thumb and your trigger. Yes. Um, you know, so there's some some little things that you can do if you truly are die hard riding. Um, for me this year, you know, it's it's my second winter owning a bike shop, and I have sold, uh, I think I've sold over a dozen sets of studded tires. We're recording right now in middle yeah. of December, and right. this is so exciting for me because it means people are relying on their bike. Yeah, right, and it. We can argue here for a second. I don't know what, what is your studded tire? What is your go-to studded tire for a daily commute? Yeah. Well, uh, we're a big uh, Schwalbe dealer. I love Schwalbe products. They just do really, really good stuff all the way around. And so so their winter lineup is amazing. Um, And so I run uh, the Marathon Winter Plus. Same. Um, Perfect. Last year, I ran the Ice Spikers. Um, and ice bikers are just super, super, they're knobby and they're, they grip on anything. Um, but they're, uh, they're a slower, they're slower. It's kind of the same reason I, I'm not the hugest fan of using fat bikes. Um, they're, they're really practical and super fun. Um, but if it's a daily commuter and it, so for me, it's really point A to point B, um, yeah, I'm going to struggle if I'm putting stuff on that's just really, really slowing me down. Obviously, you can't put any studded tires on your bike without, you know, adding some inefficiencies to it. Um, but yeah, I think the Marathon Winter Plus is is a really good choice. Um, a couple of the people here at the shop, they run the Ice Spikers. Um, so it's, 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 uh, people have different ideas about what's <laughs> what's the best way to go. Sure. Well, and you guys have a pretty solid freeze for the next yeah. few months. Like here in Denver, 
we deal with, you know, where we get ice and then it melts and then it freezes overnight in the worst places, right? Like under bridges, in the shade where you can't see it. Exactly. I really like that Winter Plus because it has a high PSI rating. So you can pump it up when you don't need them. And it's their commuter tire. So it's a nice, fairly flat, resistant tire. And the studs are replaceable. They're not, and they're not like spikes. Like I don't fear for small children around them. And so, you know, like we have, we have a, a jug of studs to replace for customers if they rip them off. But, you know, so far it's, hey, pump them up to the max if you can when you don't need them and then lower it. And we've had great success. And I've, I, the last time I really researched winter tires, I lived in Boston and it was 10 years ago and the availability was terrible and they were so expensive. Like the cheapest one was $140 per tire. And the ones we're talking about are between 80 and 85, depending on the size. And they're amazing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's no, they're they are they're a really good value. Um, it's it's I'm not saying it's not a lot of money, um, but they last for years. These tires that I'm running, I've probably been running them five or maybe this is the sixth winter. Um, I do also run them um, at a higher pressure. Um, there is you you do uh, when you run them at high pressure the stud is always working the little hole a little bit harder. And so it, it, the hole grows a little bit. Um, it's just a compromise that you make. You can, if you run them at lower, um, you won't, you won't wear out that rubber as quickly. Um, but even at my high pressures there, I'm running them for, for many years. So they are really good, really good tire to have. That's awesome. So just to kind of recap studded tires, if you live somewhere where it's, necessary or needed um and this year in denver it started to be necessary in october (laughs) and then fenders um and i'm a big fan like to your point fenders all the time you know you yes just so you can wear whatever you want to wear and not worry about getting wet and then um we already talked about visibility but lots of lights um i put reflective things all over you know my helmet and whatnot and then um pogies or bar mitts i use a lot because we deal with that like misty rain and then it freezes. And I find the biggest thing is not only does it keep my hands warm, but it protects my shifters from getting uh, the wet rain inside and then freezing. So, um, you know, especially riding, you guys sell Urban Arrow now, but their internal system, if water gets in the line, it's like, no, you're not going to shift until it thaws out. Um, Got it. Yeah. So I try to like keep my shifter protected if my bike lives outside during the day. So if it rains and then freezes before I can get it home, um, you know, the bar mitch just kind of keeps that area dry. Yeah. Right. No, that's, uh, that sounds like a really good, uh, I didn't, I'd never even thought about keeping your shifters and your brake levers out of the elements. That's, that's awesome. And then, Luke, I want you to talk to me about, like, how do you coach people into winter biking, right? Like, I try not to push people, right? Like, if you want to try it, great. I am here for you. But it has to be on you. (laughs) And so that's where, like, the attitude, like, people thought I was crazy last year because I was biking. I'm an Urban Arrow. That's my daily minivan. And I was riding with my then eight-month-old down to very cold temperatures, but he was warm. He was safe. Um, and what I always tell people, cause I live in Colorado, if you can ski in it, you can bike in it. Yeah. Right. And that's kind of my tagline for everybody. Like how, how, like last year, a couple of people shamed me, like, how dare you put your kids in your bike and, and ride? And I'm like, they're in my bike for 15 minutes. And do you really think your car is warm when you put them in? <laughs> and, yeah, right. you know, and, and, um, these same people take their six-year-olds and put them on a ski lift when it's 15 degrees out or 20 degrees out. I love it. (laughs) So that's where I lead from attitude. Like, Hey, you might think I'm crazy, but I think you're crazy skiing. So, um, what do you, how do you get people interested without shaming them without, um, also without you seeming too crazy? (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Um, right. Well, there, there is that. And, and sometimes you just have to go with that. Um, and, and, you know, it, it is what it is. So what someone thinks about what you're doing with your life, that's, that's their deal. Um, or at least that's where I'm coming from with it. Um, but when anybody is asking about, um, using their bike at, more as a transportation item, um, I'm always going to be doing my best to just be super supportive. Um, and I'm, I, a big one for me is just to point out, um, that, you know, if, if you just are on your bike a couple times, you know, even just once a week, once a week, that's, you know, that's over a 10 day period. If you take it five, five and five Monday through Friday, um, geez, once a week, that's, you just did 20%, right? I mean, that's, it's, it's a real amount. Um, and so just trying to kind of wrap your head around the idea that it's not like you have to be riding everywhere and every single day to truly make a difference mm -hmm. in your, in both, you know, your physical health, um, but your mental health, um, as well as shrinking your carbon footprint a little bit, these are all pretty big positives. Um, and so just kind of thinking that way to just kind of get your head in the game a little bit. Um, in terms of the winter part, um, I, I don't feel like it's massively uh, challenging to overcome. It's, um, to be to be honest, a big part of just becoming using your bike as transportation. It's that attitude thing that you were talking about earlier. Um, and it doesn't matter a huge, you know, it, it can be as big a hurdle to do it at 70 degrees and sun, sunny for some people as it is for me to do it when it's 15 below. <laughs> um, and I don't have a long commute. So it's, it's not like I'm, I, it, I'm not threatening my life by riding myself to yes. work. If if I had to lock my bike to a tree and walk to work, I could make it pretty easily. Um, so I don't know, just, I don't know, kind of trying to bring it down a little bit to um, just the realities of what it is. Try your best not to see the whole thing as being overwhelming. Um, and, um, I'm not saying day one won't have you a little bit anxious in the morning. Um, and if, you know, if we just got a fresh snow, that's something you're going to have to kind of adjust in your mind. But the reality is, is you can ride a bike through a lot of snow. It's amazing. It, it, I've had plenty of times, it's already happened once this year where I had determined that I was going to take the bus because um, I shoveled at home before I, before I was leaving and there was just a lot of fresh snow and I know that, um, it wouldn't have gotten cleared off, um, on that many of the streets yet. Um, but anyway, by the time I was done shoveling, I, I'd worked myself past that and I was riding to work and, and I had a fine ride to work. I didn't, I never went down and, and so, so much of it can be just kind of getting your head in the game. And, um, once you've done it a few times, it's, it's just a little bit easier to kind of have a little more confidence. I appreciate the idea that if you can work from home, work from home, you know, or yeah, work from right. that coffee shop that's closer to your house, uh, carpool, you know, like the, one of the things that I try to tell people is like, you're not committing to it for every single day and let, until you sell your car, right? Like, and almost to every customer that's like, Hey, I, I think I'm going to sell a car. And, and I always say, okay, try to not drive from January through February and then sell your car, <laughs> you know, but yeah, just, right. um, you know, give the keys to somebody if you have to. Luke mentioned a lot of things. And so what I'm going to do is do my best to collect all the links and notes that we just reviewed and 
put it in an episode show notes, uh, which you'll be able to find at bikehere.com. Like Luke mentioned, dynamos and all these other equipments. Uh, and I'll make sure that we have links. But we would love to hear from you guys. You know, um, Luke and I are both very active on Twitter and social media. So if you have winter biking questions, let us know. Maybe we'll do a, a 201 version of this and dig into more of the the geekiness of winter biking. Um, you know, I'm super interested by lights and batteries and things like that. Um, so I would appreciate if everybody went to bikehere.com. Give us comments. Give us feedback. Uh, follow Luke. And then Luke, tell people, how can they find you? You know, you have a wonderful website, your own social media. Yeah, thanks, Arlie. Um, so yeah, th- uh, yeah, we do put quite a bit of effort into the website. We try and list our products there. We try and list events. Um, so yeah, perennialcycle.com would be a great way to an on-ramp to kind of seeing more about what Perennial Cycle is about. Um, there are some specialties, you know, we're, um, there is not a single like mountain bike or road bike in the shop. Um, (laughs) but there's a lot of utility bikes. There's a lot of cargo bikes. Um, Brompton folding bikes are a really fun, uh, product that, uh, yeah, I'm really passionate about. Love those. Um, this dynamo lighting that I'm talking about, um, there aren't that many shops that are all that familiar If having lights on your bike that are powered by your front wheel is something uh, that someone's interested in, yeah, we would be a phenomenal source um, because we just, we, we do it. It's something we do all the time. Mm -hmm. And you have one line, like people can order online. Yeah, no. I have personally used your online chat for questions, (laughs) (laughs) but I don't know. I don't know who I was talking to, but I'm like, hey, it's Arlie from Bike Shop Girl. Glad. I'm trying to find this really weird ass part for a customer. And then I just send them to you. I'm really glad to hear that. You know, like, and I'm sure I do something unique that, you know, you don't want to get into. So it it keeps us all successful and focused on what we're good at. Everyone listening, thank you. This was episode number two. So if you go to bikehere.com, you can find the show notes. And until next time, this was Arlie with Bike Shop Girl. 